I think we are ready to start. Uh, there are a few lecture notes for those of you who are interested in having hard copies. Uh, and I can just pass to you. Of course, as usual, uh, the last, the last uh, night I always uh, make changes in my presentations. So you will see some differences, but yeah, just <laughs> whomever would like to keep a copy. You will see some differences, but, and then you will know them. Then you, you can note them, OK? I don't think my, uh, the microphone is working. It's working. Oh, is it? Because I, I Do you hear me? Yeah. OK, good. Uh, so it is, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the first three, three days. How was it? Was it good? OK, great, great. And I hope you will enjoy the next two days, too. <laughs> So, uh, and yesterday you were, you had the opportunity to know better what each other is doing. You had the opportunity to discuss a little bit. That's great. So, um, we will, I will start with again uh, introducing the main, this is like my acknowledgement slide, okay? Introducing the main people. Can we dim the light a little bit? You, okay. The two uh, major p people, actually Prodi was initiated by Ahmed, and then uh, in the new version, uh, Anidita also played an uh, important role. These are my two former PhD students from our uh, joint Carnegie Mellon University of Pittsburgh PhD program in computational biology. They are both in the Bay Area uh, working in companies, uh, tech, I would say biotech or tech companies. She is working at Agilent, and Ahmed is in a software development place. Uh, and uh, here are uh, the instructs, uh, the uh, research, uh, the assistant professors who would be helping uh, in teaching that portion: uh, Tim, Chakra, and Indira. And they are all sitting there, and you may have already met with them. I would like to acknowledge also Ying, who was a, another PhD student of mine, again in the Bay Area right now, again. Uh, actually, he's, <laughs> he's doing, a, he's a s director of strategies, something like that, at LinkedIn. That, <laughs> so it is, you know, uh, sometimes I'm sad that uh, some of my former students aren't doing biology anymore. But what counts is, you know, they have very good jobs and they have, uh, they're happy. So that's what matters, right? He's uh, really uh, the, he was the power behind the extension of Prodi to include sequence evolution, uh, so something that we will teach tomorrow. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, also Jihan, who is not here today. Uh, Jihan is a new student. He is following probably uh, those uh, alumni. And I, I'm very confident that he will be gradually playing an increasing role in this effort, although his major thesis topic is on SAS simulations. So two, uh, two major uh, references for that, uh, for Prodi. That was uh, published in 2011. You can see that it is relatively new but it has, there has been lots of uh, uh, progress since, uh, you know, before and since then. And a more recent version where you can uh, see uh, Ahmed and Anindita as the first co-authors, in addition to uh, several other group members and as, uh, colleagues. So this is a statistics of the usage. You don't have that in your notes, uh, or you have one, but this is the updated one. Uh, is there a pointer, Marcus? He's gone. Okay. I, have one as well. <laughs> I would. I can have one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, so you, this shows you a little bit uh, about uh, how fast this has been growing. You know, we started. We published in uh, 2011. Thank you so much. This is hardly visible, but I think yeah. you'll be able to see, hopefully. 
So it, uh, what I would like to you know, uh, point out here is that, uh, you know, look at the numbers. Each year, how the number of downloads increase. So we are here only half a year through or less. So it is, uh, uh, we, have been, uh, we have a total of uh, almost 340 downloads. And from uh, you know at least 69 different countries, and I don't know how those uh, countries are overlapping. Uh, and unique visitors is 37,000, so it is really uh, quite broadly used. And I hope uh, uh, after this workshop, you will be one of the users too, if not if you were not already using it. The uh, tutorials for that uh, Prodi. So we have essentially four major uh, components, although uh, Tim is going to tell more uh, about the details of each, uh, other tutorials too, which are online accessible. This is the address uh, URL. Uh, so you, I think in your notes you have a plus here. Remove that plus. There is no plus. This is just tutorials, OK? So uh, th uh, you have uh, the ProD, of course, the main uh, body of the uh, software. The NMWIS uh, stands for, PRODI stands for Pro Protein Dynamics, and many people read it PRODI. We started as PRODI, I continue as PRODI. Okay. And NMWIS is for normal mode wizard, if you like, or vis visualization uh, component. Uh, evolve will be on uh, sequence evolution and co-evolution, some of the items that Zan mentioned, but we have more emphasis on co-evolution, how two different amino acids change simultaneously, because we are very much into understanding correlations between amino acids. And finally, drugability is an important component. This uh, drugability is actually a, a tool where you use both MD simulations and the statistical analysis tools that are available in uh, PRODI. So here is, a, again, an overview before we go into the details. Uh, as input, you can enter in this uh, package, you can enter a sequence. And the sequence may be in, for example, FASTA format. It doesn't need to be an entire sequence. It may be a sequence of interest. Alternatively, you can in enter a protein PDB code, too. But now uh, I'm starting from input sequence. And then uh, for that sequence, what the ProD is going to do, it's going to go to the uh, PDB, identify all uh, structures. You, know, you all know what PDB is, right? It will identify from the PDB all the structures that contain that sequence. Or even it may uh, also identify the closed sequence homologs. So if you define a threshold, let's say you say 95%, it will also extract its, uh, some mutants or uh, some family members. Now you have immediately, <coughs> with one click, you have now the set of all structures existing in the PDB for your query sequence, including uh, the different mutants, complexes, because uh, that sequence may be only one part of the entire PDB structure. And now you can do lots of analysis. One of them is uh, the way we started originally was uh, in a paper published, published in 2009 in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science with Ahmed. The way we started was we take all those uh, structures from the PDB, we align them, structurally align them, and yesterday Zan talked about structural alignment, so we have our own uh, software here that does the structural alignment. Now, when you structurally align them, you see here the superposition of those uh, structures, right? You have many of them. For P38, a kinase, that is a very important drug target. And then, when you have this type of structural alignment, you can define an average structure, okay, by taking the average of all coordinates. And you can see how much uh, each individual structure departs from the average. So you have any understanding of uh, the structural variation with respect to an average representative structure, okay? Uh, 
you can also take a structure, an average structure, the one that is closest to the average among this set as your single model where you are going to do predictive co computations using elastic network models. So all those, if you go to the history, all, all these type of studies started when we introduced the elastic network models for proteins. You just take a single structure and one of you was asking me yesterday, it's not a simulation. The big difference with respect to what you've learned so far is we get results instantly. We are solving something as a unique solution to understand the dynamics, OK? So we can have a representative structure to be analyzed by elastic network model, YA. Well, this is called the anisotropic network model, OK? So this is for ANM analysis, anisotropic network model. And then this is for PCA. What is PCA? Exactly, principal component analysis. So when you have an ensemble of structures, you can do a, what's called a principal component analysis to just identify what are the major changes in structure. So any change, you know, the change may be described in terms of an ensemble of principal modes of deformation, principal modes of change with respect to the average. So principal component analysis does that. Now, uh, suppose you are now considering two structures, OK? A major change could be the overall banding. And then you may have a small change, let's say, at some peripheral regions, some loop regions, side chains. When you do the principal component analysis, the goal is to extract the major change, OK? So it's very different from MD, where MD emphasizes a lot those local interactions. And it's very uh, precise. These things are not precise. They are rough, but they give you an understanding of the big picture. Okay? This is the compromise. If you want, at the same time, the big picture and the details, you need to use hybrid models. And there are such hybrid models that we have developed. Actually, we started in collaboration with Klaus several uh, years ago. The first paper was in 2008. So I, I, Klaus already explained the MD part. I'm uh, going to tell you what you can learn. It's like a quick and dirty study, if you like. It's very fast, but you also acquire information that would otherwise be not available through simulations. You have, and this is uh, the major utility, and I'm going to come to that, is that you can apply this to very, very big systems. You don't wait, you get results immediately. And you get movies immediately. So when you do principal component analysis, uh, you have uh, now what this analysis and what PRODI does, and you will see in the hands-on tutorial too, is, okay, uh, you, for that particular structure, you can generate uh, what are the principal deformation, and one way of displaying them, if I had, uh, I could show movies, but an alternative way, especially for papers, is to show the arrows. So what you see here, this, is, this we call it experimental, OK? This is all experimental data. And we get those experimental arrows, uh, violet here, showing that the principal mode of motion is actually some kind of you know, relative movement of those two lobes. And from uh, the ANM analysis also, we get uh, the principal modes of motions just based on a single structure, analyzing the topology, modeling it as a network. And we can plot here the principal motions. Now, we have two sources of information. One is purely uh, experimental, analysis of experimental data. And the other one is essentially what you predict with the elastic network model based on physical uh, theories, graph theory. And you can uh, uh, compare them. Now, you have a series of modes from experiments, series of modes from theory. And you can put together this. Uh, heat map, if you like, showing how they correlate. Usually, usually in most applications, we are actually interested in one or two modes, which are the, uh, what are the domain movements. And these were, would be really uh, underlying the function of like the allosteric interactions. They would be facilitating substrate binding, protein, protein binding, protein ligand binding. OK. All right. And then what else can you do? Now, we uh, suppose this is our equilibrium structure, and we have now generated a series of modes. 
either from principal compound analysis or from AM analysis. Now we know that many different mechanisms of motion, if you like, these are all uh, uh, normalized deformation vectors for all amino acids. Okay? We know those def uh, the components of these deformation vectors for all amino acids. Now we can use those deformation vectors uh, or structural change vectors, <laughs> which are actually uh, the principal components or the ANM modes. We can use them to generate alternative conformations. And this is really important for docking simulations. You know that uh, some of you who have already done something on docking, you would know that rigid docking is uh, good in a few cases, but in the large majority, or at least like 60%, now they say 75% of cases, you need to take into account the flexibility of the target protein. You cannot have your protein to be rigid when a ligand or another substrate is binding. Okay? It, uh, just, it, this type of flexibility will probably expose a binding epitope, will optimize the interaction. This is critically important. And now, uh, knowing this type of most uh, probable, most cooperative modes, you can generate, actually, an ensemble of conformations. You just take those modes, a series of the, those modes. Each of them has actually its known probability, the eigenvalue in, this, uh, in our decomposition. And using these uh, values, now you can generate an ensemble of conformations in the neighborhood uh, of the, your original structure and repeat your docking simulations with this ensemble. So that's the idea. Now, when we've done this, actually, I, sorry for this message. I don't know, this pops up. It's going to pop up a few times during this lecture, so get familiar with it. <laughs> so we can have a, now what we are displaying here is the following. The blue uh, points are the experimental structures, okay, for P38. And then the red ones are those we generated through, uh, along the AM modes. And this is the conformational space, subspace if you like, principles uh, reduce subspace which is uh, spanned by three principal coordinates. So we, can, we, we cannot visualize things in a three-n dimensional space, right? Uh, but we can project things into a reduced space. And each point represents a protein uh, that we predict along the ANM mode, the red ones. And the blue ones are each a protein experimental result. And you can see that the ANM uh, predicted, ANM predicted conformers really cover the space of experimentally resolved structures. Now, when you do these things with MD simulations, uh, and these are, again, the blue experiments, and the point dots are from MD. What MD tends to do, it, we, it may tend to you know, move in a certain direction, get trapped in a minimum, and not all the space of experimental conformers are being sampled. So that is an, a very important observation. This one is much faster, and it really pro gives you a better coverage of the conformational space. Okay? So that's why we strongly, uh, and many groups have been doing this type of docking simulations by just t uh, considering those deformations. Okay. Now we are getting a little bit into how we do all these things. Okay? This is an image that I like. I didn't do it. I wish I could. <laughs> But it shows a network representation, and this is the way we think of the proteins, okay, or biomolecular systems. Nodes and edges. Now, the nodes will be in our models, they usually represent a single amino acid, and the edges will be springs that connect those amino acids, the residues. Uh, and we put the edges only when a given pair of amino acids is sufficiently close to interact within an interaction range. So our structure looks like a network. We can go beyond the capability of full atomic simulations. We, have, uh, we incorporate structural data at multiple levels of resolution. And I think, uh, although I put it last, this was also a major thing. Uh, my background is actually, I, ca I came from chemical engineering, and then I did material science. And as materials, I didn't do biomaterials, I did polymers. 
that polymer physics was my PhD topic, polymer chemistry, if you like. But uh, those theories that have been developed for uh, material science for in chemical engineering, etc., we use a lot in, uh, you know, beauty. It's, it's always an advantage if you come from a different discipline and you bring your own perspective, a fresh look. I think this is always an advantage. So uh, I think Chakra is a good example. He disappeared now, but he is coming from computer science and he has been, you know, bringing all those computer science concepts for uh, these problems. But of course, you need to have a solid uh, physical science understanding too. No question about it. The major advantages? Well, we have, uh, you will see that we can visualize the global dynamics. Global is the opposite to, to local. So uh, in general, when you do MD simulations, you really see the local interactions in much details, right? In this case, we see the global dynamics. It was things that are very cooperative, how domains move with respect to each other, how there is a major, you know, allosteric change in the structure. <sighs> Applicability to large systems, that's a major advantage. So, of course, uh, we'll show you the examples for small proteins, but I think what is uh, the beautiful part of it is if you have a large complex, if you have an as assembly, if you have a multimer, uh, so you can. Uh, you can apply these methods very easily and get immediate results. Cooperativity, that is what actually those models capture. Uh, so, and it is very much in line with what we say here, when we say global, something that really engages the entire structure. They are, uh, the motions that we predict are highly cooperative. Efficiency, and you will see how they are efficient. We can get immediate results. And then because we are able to uh, have those large domain movements and uh, able to have an understanding of the mechanisms of interactions, uh, which are much beyond the time scale of MD simulations, because those large scale movements are microsecond, uh, milliseconds or slower. So we can relate these things to actually experimental observables. I think that's a big, big uh, issue. Then you can interpret, you can understand better at the molecular level what is happening, why a certain system uh, gives rise to this type of you know, experimental measurements. So this is one of my classical <laughs> slides where I would like to say that proteins are not static. I don't need to say this to this uh, uh, group. They, you all know that they move, They dance, if you like, they interact with each other. So this is a, you may know this protein, it's a, so a bacterial chaperone in, I don't know if you are familiar with, but it assists the folding of other proteins by enclosing them in its cavity, it's a cylindrically shaped molecule. And now we, uh, by our analysis, you know, when, by moving the molecule along the slow modes, uh, we know that we can uh, focus on some local interactions, and we will get back to that, but these interfacial interactions are very important at, at the interface between the rings. So we can get to the biologically relevant uh, data, or we can uh, also make predictions on the global motions. We can, uh, but even our local motions are coarse grained, right? It's not the, the atomic details. Uh, we have just, we examine portions. And global motions will be the entire molecule. So this is actually, this region will open up to bind a cap. Uh, the cap comes off or and on depending on the release of the partially folded or unfolded protein. So that is a, a, that's a fascinating machine. And now we know better how this machine functions with the help of these simulations. Here are two more examples. So these are things that you can generate using Prodi. This is a, a viral capsid, but it also has its all, uh, own genetic material. So it is not, oh no, I hear a little bit. It has its own genetic material, which means the DNA uh, in it. And we have an understanding of the way the capsid rearranges. So for example, the maturation of viral capsids is an important phenomenon. And what are the critical interactions that mediate the ma uh, ma maturation? Or uh, you can, uh, for example, this is one subunit of a larger complex, the, actually the Groyal complex. 
and we can see exactly what are the types of hinge banding movements that take place. And we can, you know, these type of studies are important because you can make that inferences on critical sites. So if you have a movement like that, okay, and suppose now you want to design a drug that uh, obstructs this movement. What, uh, when you design a drug, it's not sufficient to know the target. You need to know which site to bind your drug. What would be the site for you that would be optimally um, affecting the functionality? By the way, dynamics is function, to my view. It has to move to do its function. If you obstruct the dynamics, you just uh, block the functionality. So you need, uh, what would you think intuitively? So this is the protein moving like that. My arm is a protein. And you want my arm to stop by a drug, a blocker. You want to bind a drug. Where would you bind it? Elbow. Yeah, exactly. And this is called the hinge, OK? Hinge for my arm. <laughs> so we, would, we identify the hinge sites. And if you go to the PDB, you will see that in many uh, drug-bound uh, complexes, the drugs are sitting at the hinge sites, you know, the interface between the to domains. And some of them are not so obvious. In this case, you have actually an ATP binding there. So ATP also needs to bind to a critical position that would be, you know, when there is an energy released, this energy will be then released to that hinge region, which will be powering, you know, the motion. Things like that. These are all engineering principles, after all. Or this is another example. This is a receptor. We just uh, now uh, have a publication on that, uh, uh, submitted to one, revi being revised. Uh, showing how, for example, this type of uh, structural changes can be measured experimentally. So the, these type of movements that we are predicting are not, uh, can be verified experimentally. One way is you, have, you put here crosslinks, disulfide crosslinks. You substitute cysteines. What do cysteines do when they are in close proximity? in the presence of a reducing agent. They form disulfide bridges, covalent bonds. And suppose now you have, in the presence of a reducing agent, you have cysteines here and not nowhere else. And then if they form disulfide bridges, this movement will be blocked, right? Because now you have locked it in a closed form. And the activity of this receptor, amper receptor, will be blocked as well. And that's what experimentally we are observing in a collaboration with a group at the MRC, University of Cambridge. Yes? Are you also predicting, sorry, are you also predicting the type scales of these movements? Are we predicting what? The time scales of the motions. Ta no, very good question. We don't know the time scales of the motions, absolute time scales, but we know the relative time scales. Because what we're, it's an approximate model. Uh, it's not like MD where you have full for, uh, fledged force field. It's an, but what we predict accurately, I would say, is the mechanism of motion. And then we have a series of uh, distribution of different modes of motions, and we know their relative time scales. So that one, for example, is the one which takes longest time. The frequency is lo slowest, lowest frequency, or the motion is slowest. Okay. We can, uh, you know, we like to calibrate if when there is experimental data, we, and we can compare a mode. For example, uh, we like to calibrate with respect to experiments, but we don't know the absolute scale otherwise. Okay, one challenge currently is to feel, uh, to uh, acquire information on the, at the meso scale. What is a meso scale? So this is molecular uh, simulations. This is cellular, OK? And then you have here tissue, cell tissue. Uh, this is subcellular. Uh, and then this is the entire cell or multiple cells, tissue. Now we are, of course, uh, we are mostly interested in uh, bridging between molecular events and subcellular events. So in this case, what you're seeing is a single molecule, the top view embedded in a membrane. The green molecules are the membrane, lipid molecules. 
In this case, you are seeing just a portion of uh, at the cell. So these are different portions of the cellular, postsynaptic, presynaptic, uh, neuronic contacts. So it is a, a, what we call a subcellular region. And we would like to bridge between those events. So whatever is happening at the molecular level has ramifications at the subcellular level. So we, the goal, you know, the big goal of our center is to be able to fill the gap between those two different scales. There are established methods, more or less, for the molecular systems, which you've seen now. And also for cellular, we had a workshop for cellular systems to, uh, a couple of weeks ago. But to merge, you know, to understand, to have a multi-scale view, a really integrated multi-scale view, is the big challenge nowadays. And you can see the different time scales. So what we are doing, therefore, is to uh, focus on those two different scales and expand them and build a series of intermediate level uh, approaches to uh, gradually fill the gap. So instead of you know, conventional MD simulations, which you've seen, there are uh, methods like accelerated MD, Brownian dynamics. I thought one of you mentioned, okay, you're doing Brownian dynamics. So these permit us to go to a slightly higher scales. And then we have the elastic network models, which I'm gonna describe, they can also help us reach higher scales. But uh, I think this figure is misleading. We need a bigger gap in between, between this one and this one. So we are just trying to build such methodologies. This is like the big picture. Or oh, you can see the big picture here too. You know, you have uh, uh, bond vibrations, side chain motions, loop motions, et cetera, domain subunits, and then the entire cooperative machinery. So that's where we are in our, uh, we're uh, examining large uh, substructures, uh, like uh, large assemblies or substructures of the cellular environment, in the cellular environment, try and trying to reach this type of time scales and length scales. Uh, and this is my, uh, what I was just trying to say. Knowing structure is not enough to understand the function. You need to go through dynamics, and that's what we're doing right here. Now, the elastic network models, let's go a little bit deeper now, deeper, deeper. This, uh, we were inspired by a polymer chemist, Paul Flory, who got the Nobel Prize in 1974, who introduced the theory of rubber elasticity for rubbery materials like uh, polymer networks. And then we said, uh, maybe proteins also are kind of rubbery materials. They are not liquid, they are not solid, right? They are viscoelastic, if you like. Elasticity is a solid-like property. Viscosity is liquid-like, they are viscoelastic. And maybe uh, uh, we could take advantage of some uh, theory that had been built for synthetic materials. And that's how we started, actually. And then, of course, biological systems are very, very peculiar. And we had to make suitable uh, improvements. But overall, that's the basis. And indeed, uh, you, what we've done is we take a given structure and just we map it into a network representation. So there's a movie here of a student, which I like to show. OK. So the movie shows a protein, adelaide kinase in this case, and the fo we focus on the backbone. And then on the backbone, we, we take the alpha carbons, okay, these are alpha carbons, and we connect all alpha carbons that are within proximity, let's say 10 angstrom, so we get a network. So now we have a, no a system of nodes and springs, that's our model. And this model can be analyzed to obtain different modes of motions. These are called normal, normal in the sense that they are orthogonal each other. They are not mixed, in the, they are independent. So we have a series of modes that we can, let's say we have shown here only three modes. So we, take, we use those different modes uh, to, you, do you want me to play again or you're done? Maybe I will. <laughs> this was fast. So this is the whole strategy. You take the PDB coordinates, you uh, identify the alpha carbons, you know the coordinates of alpha carbons, you calculate their distances, 
Select all pairs within close proximity. Connect them by a network. Now you have a network. And then the network, which is, uh, will be analyzed, and this part will come to that, to obtain this type of global uh, movements accessible to it. That's why another global movement. And these are color coded, by the way. The red is the portion that moves the most, and blue would be the uh, portion that moves the least in this representation, at least in this figure. And we can apply these things now to really large systems, uh, uh, molecular machines, to understand the dominant types of movements, OK? <coughs> A little bit more details now. And uh, you know, I will give you more details. And those of you who don't like equations, try to bear with me, because there will be very few of them, OK? <laughs> Very good question. I'll come to that, OK? Now, um, this is the, uh, but the thing I can say right now is that we choose the same spring constant for everything. It's not specific. I mean, it's specific. And there are many, many variations. My, probably Tim will talk about that. You can improve it. But the first model and the most broadly used is a uniform spring constant for all pairs. Very easy. So you have a single parameter, if you like, the spring constant. But even that is not a parameter, and I will explain. <laughs> so this is the network. OK. So one thing you just need to memorize, it's simple, easy, is uh, for the k node, k node, we have rk. It's a position vector. Okay. It's like in the PDB, you have the XYZ components for each I mean, atom. Now, for each alpha carbon, we have this uh, XYZ coordinates represented by a three-dimensional position vector. Easy, right? OK. And now, another thing you need to remember is that uh, is the change in the position vector. So the change in the position vector of, in the position of node J, and the change in the position of node I. Now, the difference between the changes will be also the difference in the distance, uh, in the change in the distance between them. So Rij is the vector that connects J and I. Change in uh, I and J is also equal to the change in the distance, Rij. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. Um, is the spring constant the same for? Yes, it is. Because, uh, because for example, if the one of the two um, parts of the chart, then yeah. the interactions are yeah. stronger than that you, yeah, you are absolutely right. These were uh, all, we had all those thoughts. And more important than that, you have two amino acids that are connected, covalently bounded, OK? I and I plus one. And then you have two that are not bounded, uh, maybe interacting weakly. So we had, uh, in the first original paper in 1997, we had two force constants to distinguish bonded and non-bonded. And then we, when we compare with experimental data and a wealth of experimental data, it didn't make a difference to introduce an extra parameter to discriminate between those two types of interactions because we were able to predict experimental data equally well. So I will show that, OK? <laughs> these are good points. And these are intuitively, these are things that you should ask. But uh, we went through that and then said, OK, no, no. Uh, we should take the pain of introducing one more parameter if the gain is so small and there were practically no gain. Okay. All right, this is a raised to i uh, position. It is, it's we call that fluctuation. That r i is the fluctuation in this position. And this is the fluctuation in that position. This is the original distance. This is the distance after fluctuations. Okay. And then the distance change between this guy and this guy is that r i j. That's all. This is the notation. <laughs> so what we do is uh, the following. When we say we construct a network, we need some metrics, right, to represent our network. And we represent it in terms of what's called a connectivity matrix or Kirchhoff matrix. And this is coming from electrical engineering, actually. Kirchhoff matrix is used there <laughs> quite for describing networks, actually, circuits. So what, uh, what does the Kirchhoff matrix represent? We are going to have here one, uh, for the off-diagonal terms, we have ones and zeros, OK? Simple. One, if 
two residues are connected, zero if they are not, okay? Very simple. What does the Kirchhoff matrix in shape look like? What does it look like? Are you familiar with something called contact maps? Have you ever heard contact maps? <laughs> so for describing the tertiary structure, sometimes people uh, build those contact maps, I and J. And then the entries that are filled are the residues that make contacts and others are zero. You can have contour plots. So it's in shape similar. Uh, so in this represent, it goes from zero to n, one to n, first residue to n residue, first residue to n residue, okay? And of course, you know, here, what you see here are ones. Think, think of them as ones, but sometimes I put the ones in, the, in the horizontally, don't worry about it. So this region is very populated by ones, okay? Why? Yeah, they, due to connectivity. Simply, they are along the same chain, right? So these are first neighbors, second neighbors. But now you have here a, a, a region where uh, that is also highly interacting. You know, as when I increases, J also increases, so I, I, I and J, I plus one, J plus one, I plus two, J plus two, et cetera, they are, they are making contacts. What does it mean, structurally? So there is a series of residues that are interacting with a series of residues with one increment at a time, yes. It is a? It's a secondary, what type of secondary structure? What? what? Beta strands, parallel beta strands. They both increase by one, okay? They're going to. And if it's an anti-parallel beta strand, you will have, when I increases, you have J decreasing, right? Here we, well, we, it's not an anti-parallel, but may, maybe somewhere, if we have something like that, it's gonna be an anti-parallel beta strand. And if those, uh, there is something really close, let's say, to the diagonal, every third residue or fourth residue making contact, it is a? Alpha helix, okay. So by looking at the map, this Greek of matrix, you already know what, you know, the t what we call the tertiary contacts. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you something really good now. If you know the Kirchhoff matrix, if you construct it, just take the differences between position vectors, right? You, you just need to know the distances, and you connect everything within 10 angstrom alpha carbons. If you know this matrix, you're done. This is the only ingredient of the theory. Can you believe that? <laughs> as simple as that. This is the only ingredient of the theory. And we make tons of things using this type of connectivity matrices. Uh, this is uh, the simplest version, but this is what's called the Gaussian network model. So we have a n by n matrix, actually the more advanced version, the ANM that I have been talking about, the anisotropic, will have three elements, X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z for each pair of residues, if you take the X, Y, Z. And then you take, uh, in normal model analysis, it's called the Hessian. I'm not gonna go into those details, but maybe Tim will. <laughs> but uh, the fundamental thing is that, if you know this matrix, if you take its uh, inverse, and you don't need to t do manually, you can do on a computer. And there is also a trick because it's the matrix, uh, I didn't mention the diagonal elements. The diagonal elements are found from the negative sum of off-diagonal terms. Complicated sentence. So suppose we have one, 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 three ones here, okay? Uh, making contacts. The diagonal will be minus three. In many cases, we take the opposite. We put minus one, minus one, minus one, we put three. Doesn't, the sign doesn't matter. The inverse, the eigenvalue will be the same. So uh, in a sense, if a residue uh, I is making three contacts, the diagonal is going to be three or minus three, OK? So the diagonal is a me measure of what? No, it's gonna be three, five, eight, three, two, et cetera. 
depending on the number of neighbors. Each re so each node, you can call it connectivity, maybe you were thinking like connectivity, the number of connections, which is called the degree of a network. But in physical terms, it is just some kind, uh, exactly, it's actually stiffness, or it is, uh, it is actually the coordination number of each amino acid, if you like, or it's a measure of packing density. So if something is really very densely packed, it, if it has many, many neighbors, the diagonal term is going to be high, right? Now, if you, you take the inverse of this matrix, roughly speaking, just very roughly, the diagonal, the terms that are high are going to be small, right? So if a given residue has many, many connections, if its coordination number is high, motions. its motions will be suppressed. So it's mean square fluctuations, the delta Ri square for the residue I is going to be smaller if this diagonal term is large, roughly speaking. Of course, you need to do the entire decomposition, but roughly speaking, just to give you. So that you, you take the inverse and you, you look at the diagonal element of the inverse. There is a proportionality constant, a Boltzmann constant temperature and the spring constant, which we, I haven't yet explained. Okay. But forget the proportionality constant because it uh, uniformly scales down or up everything, all the residues. So for each residue, the mean square fluctuation mm -hmm. is nothing else than the inverse of the Kirchhoff matrix uh, I diagonal element. Very simple. So if you know this matrix, you invert it, you look mm -hmm. at the diagonal elements, it gives you the mean square fluctuations with a scaling, uh, with a coefficient, okay, fixed coefficient. Likewise, you could do the data, are, uh, the correlation between I and uh, J residue. I don't know if I have it here. Uh, the correlation between the fluctuations of two residues will be the IJ di diagonal element, uh, of diagonal element. Very simple. Now there is also a one more trick, and that uh, is it. This uh, connectivity matrix, you can write it as the sum of many, many matrices by eigenvalue decomposition of the matrix. So you have, and each uh, matrix itself will be uh, describing a different contribution to the overall fluctuation, different mode of motion. So by decomposition and obtaining the eigenvalues and eigenvectors there, so this is called an eigenvalue decomposition of this matrix. And you get a series of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So you have a, a term for each mode k. So in a sense, you can decompose the motion into the contribution of different modes. This is mode spectral decomposition. You have a spectrum of modes. And now you are identifying different uh, modes. And among them, the, uh, the ones that have the lowest eigenvalue, because the eigenvalue is representative of the frequency, if the eigenvalue is small for a given mode k, you see this coefficient is going to be high, and it will be making a big contribution to the fluctuation or to the mean square fluctuation or the correlation. So we were interested in extracting out of this spectral of modes, the slowest modes, the ones with uh, k equals 1, 2, 3, etc. Okay. I hope it's going well. <laughs> so the rest is a repetition, uh, a little bit in more details, but I'm going to skip these things for those of you who are really interested in how, uh, how that relationship so these are all the details, everything that I, I already explained. The thing is, uh, the overall potential, you can write it as a sum of harmonic potentials between all the springs. And you can represent it in a compact notation using the uh, connectivity matrix. So all these things, and I will be really happy to answer questions if you have um, uh, questions or more details. But the bottom line, the thing you need to remember is just uh, this type of cross uh, you know, if I and J are different, now it's not anymore mean square fluctuation, but it is the cross-correlation between I and J, I'll get back to I and J, 
this cross correlation scales with the ij's of diagonal term of the inverse. That's all. But another name for this cross correlation, now this one moves like that and this one moves like that. Another uh, term is what? Covariance, they call it also. How these two rays juice covary. So uh, that you may have, think of th two types of correlations, strong correlations. They can move in the same direction. They are correlated. They can move in opposite directions. These are called anti-correlated. Or they can move in perpendicular directions. And this is very hard to do, try to do it. You know, this one perpendicular to that. This is uncorrelated. <laughs> My brain cannot function like that. I cannot do it. <laughs> So, the, uh, so this will be zero then because their directions, they are orthonormal to each other, right? Cosine, the dot product takes account of the cosine between the two vectors. So it's going to be zero uncorrelated. The others will be plus one or minus one when you normalize with respect to the magnitude. You haven't analyzed. This is the summary. Okay. And then there are many applications. Uh, and uh, I still haven't answered your question. Now I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> Suppose you take hemoglobin, a very well-studied protein, right? Which we still don't understand well. But uh, we, can, we learn a lot. Now it's a tetramer formed by four monomers. And two of the tetramers, uh, monomers are called alpha-1 and alpha-2 subunits. And the other two are beta-1 and beta-2. So what we do is we take the structure, we build the Kirchhoff matrix, we invert the Kirchhoff matrix, and we plot the diagonal elements here, which give us uh, a profile for the mean square fluctuations, correct? As a function of residue number. So these are delta r i square, and you can see but the red is the theory. Okay. Then in the PDB, some of you know that Next to the x, y, z columns, there is another column. It's called the B factors. You know, when they report uh, the X-ray crystallographic structures, when they report to you the x, y, z coordinates, they not only report the point, but they also tell you the fluctuation in that point. Okay? The B factors are a measure of the uncertainty, if you like, in this position. And they reflect the flexibility of, uh, you know, conformational flexibility at that point. How this particular amino acid is defined in space. Is it broadly distributed its position? Because after all, it's like a Gaussian distribution. Or is it narrowly distributed? So they give you the mean position plus the covariance in the mean position, which is the B factor. We have a column for that, for each structure in the PDB, for or, uh, all X-ray structures. So then those B factors are to us experimental data. They give a measure of the fluctuation. Okay? And then we compare our profile. Now we don't know the absolute height of our profile because we don't know gamma, right? We, don't, we just, uh, I said here, okay, they are proportional. So I can uh, plot this mean square fluctuation based on the diagonal elements, but I don't know the absolute height of it. To get the absolute height, we, uh, of our profile normalized distribution, we look at the B factors, and we multiply everything by a fixed number, which is the gamma, you know, this gamma, to get, uh, you know, superposition. So this is the only parameter, so we know what gamma is from that type of comparison. Now this is a really, uh, a very long topic to discuss, I don't like to normalize the mean square fluctuations and <laughs> based on the B factors. Because to me, it's all about the relative movement of different residues. And the B factors themselves just represent the size of the motion in the crystal environment. And in solution, <clears throat> under physiological environment, the movements are larger, right? So what's the point then? What matters is the relative profile, yes. Experimentally, you mean? No, just so well computational. So taking uh, crystal structure with a micro-arm, something like that, to let it relax. 
you are one step ahead of my slides. I'm going to get there, OK? OK, let's see. Is it? Here you go. <laughs> you, are, you asked the question for this slide. Did you know that I was coming there? <laughs> OK, so this is the crystal environment, right? And I think this is a, a, an important uh, revelation, it was to me at least when I first saw this type of pictures, that in the crystal structure, actually, when we resolve proteins, they are sitting in those lattices, right? Uh, so we, for example, we do the analysis for this single uh, protein, but the protein is surrounded by replica, same structure in the crystal lattice. And interestingly, depending on the crystallization conditions, the same protein. You can have different packing arrangements to crystal packing. So the B factors that are being observed in the crystal environment are sometimes affected by those crystal contacts. So although, let's say, this residue could move more, because it is interacting with another one, they will have some kind of suppression in their mobility. You see what I mean? Uh, so it is a close-up view of the same region where you know the red and blue come together, and indeed there is there are two charged residues that form a salt bridge, etc. So when actually we do those ca our calculations for this protein, when we do our calculations, and this is the green curve, the theoretical curve. And we compare with the experimental curve, which is, let's say, red or blue, I don't, uh, I don't remember. Uh, probably one for each, di for different ones. We see that you know, the theory predicts much larger fluctuations at those positions. The mean square fluctuations predicted by the theory are much higher than those observed experimentally. Why? That's true, but the wrong, correct answer, and the more correct answer is because the experiments are wrong. The experimental B factors are wrong. <laughs> These are artifacts of the crystal structure. Uh, and the protein normally doesn't have those contacts in the physiological environment. So the th theory doesn't take account of the crystal contacts, indeed. Uh, and then we repeated our calculations, now I remember. Repeated our calculations with the crystal contacts pu published here. And then we got exactly you know, a very good agreement with the experiments. So our theory became as false as the experiments when we take it. <laughs> OK. Would you, in a, if you plotted the same thing with the RMSD from an NMR ensemble, would that correlate better? Beautiful. Uh, this is really, uh, I, I'm very impressed by you, by the way. You're really good. <laughs> We've been doing this for several years now, and you're really good. Excellent point. And actually, with Angela, who is Angela Gronenborn, who is an outstanding NMR biologist, we published uh, a couple of papers where we've shown that, indeed, when you take the NMR models and you superimpose them, the structural variation among the NMR models is also another measure of the mean square fluctuations of residues. And what is even more interesting is NMR models structural variation agrees better with the elastic network model predictions. Because these are in solution and there are no such constraints and the movements are allowed to be you know, expressed in the solution environment. OK. So I already spoke on that, that uh, when you have the cross correlation or mean square fluctuation, you have several modes contributing. And you can write as a summation of those modes. We already spoke on that. Uh, but now you know what I mean. And you can write in terms of eigenvalues. And we'll do, uh, so we wrote you know, some, uh, these were some original papers. But you can, I already spoke on these things. So I'm just going to skip them. Uh, now the protein, the folded protein sits at an energy minimum, right? But this surface is asymmetric. And the slow modes, the softest, we call them also softest modes, because the corresponding eff eff effective stiffness is s smallest. In the soft mode, the eigenvalue is smaller. And these are along the directions that require the least ascent for a given displacement, right? So these are the soft modes. And based on the soft modes, we have the profiles. And then we have the other extreme of very uh, high frequency modes, which appear like peaks. 
These are regions that are high. You need to, you know, you need also to be able to interpret your results. That's very important. <laughs> you have a tool, now you got lots of results. You will see you're gonna get lots of results. Then what? You need to be able to interpret them. You will have this type of prodi will give you this type of curves. Okay? What is it? The, the top one is the profile, the mean square fluctuation, driven by the slowest mode only. One, so I extracted the contribution of the most cooperative motion, and I plot the contribution here as a function of raised due number. This is the, actually the most significant for interpreting the function. You see, uh, this, there's a minimum here. This is for HIV protease, actually. This minimum tells you, oh, this is the hinge site because everything uh, is moving with respect to this region, right? And this is also another hinge site. These are two hinge sites because they are not moving. Their fluctuations is zero in the global modes. And the other parts are moving, okay? Hinge sites. One of the hinge sites actually is the active site. So this is where the catalytic uh, or, for example, act biologically active uh, action, biological action takes place. Sometimes you need, uh, and in most cases, that's, that's, these are important concepts. You need for catalytic enzymatic activity, for chemical reactivity, you need precision. You need your catalytic amino acids to be exactly predisposed you know, to achieve that chemical uh, reactivity. So they would be sitting at a hinge side where things are not moving much. But then, very close to this region, you need also a flexible region. Here is uh, the loop, uh, this tells us. You have, I don't know how many times you've heard that there are those catalytic loops. The loops will serve as a flag, they move a lot, they attract the substrate, uh, and they accommodate the substrate. Because they are flexible, the loop will be helping the binding of the substrate, the ligand, which, and then the reaction will take place very precisely at the active site. So there is, uh, you know, there are very, very, very nice papers, recent reviews on the dichotomy of protein evolution and function. You have always the opposite behaviors standing side by side. Next to this very uh, stable, very robust enzymatic site, you have a very flexible loop. And you need both of them you know, to reside side by side. This is what I mean by the dichotomy. And uh, there are many, many such uh, interesting things in the way the proteins are designed. It's not intelligent design, but it is, <laughs> they are really quite cap capable. Okay. And in the case of the anisotropic network model, you know, the, I said this is the extension to three n dimensional space now. The corresponding Kirchhoff matrix is formed now, a, instead of a, a single element, each element is now represented in a, as a three by three block. And this, uh, so these are called super elements. Those super elements are uh, the super elements of the matrix known as the Hessian, H. So H is a three n by three matrix. And I don't know this H here. I, I meant to put here, uh, okay, that will be fine. And now you have a given structure you can map into network representation. This one is color coded. Red is the part that are moving alas, uh, the most. And for the same structure, you can generate a series of different modes. So one is the opening, closing like that, another is a twisting, and then a higher mode is something more localized. So you, you get the point, right? And for each mode, each mode itself is a fluctuation. So this one is a soft motion. <coughs> this one is stiffer, this one is very stiff. Questions. This slide is an important slide. <laughs> questions. No questions. Okay. Everything is crystal clear. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so this is how what the energy minimum looks like, right? And uh, this is our native state here, sitting at an energy minimum. And what we are essentially doing is to evaluate, to identify those uh, directional vectors. 
Each mode is a directional vector for the movement in the conformation energy landscape. So this is the conformation energy landscape. This is where the protein sits at a minimum. And now we know we have one mode and we have another mode of motion. Each mode is like a path in the energy landscape. And during, by moving along this path, actually you can hit another substate, substate two, or maybe approach another substate three. So the, uh, one pr you know, this idea of a native structure for a protein, it's wrong. <laughs> there is no such thing as a single native structure. Because, and uh, these are, uh, there's an ensemble of conformations actually. There's the open form, there's the closed form. Which one is native? They are both native, you know, they are both functional. Yeah. And then there is, uh, let's say for membrane protein, there's the inward facing, outward facing. There's the, uh, you know, dur during an allosteric cycle, your protein samples many, many uh, native conformations. <laughs> So they are all native, actually. And you can think of the native state as a macro, a little bit more relaxed state, which has multiple substates, OK? So that's the concept. Yes? So all the states that it kind of access, are they all higher energy? Like, what if the ground state that we're starting from? This is the ground state, yeah. So what if what the structure we start from isn't it's an artificial minimum, for whatever reason? Can it access a lower energy state? I didn't understand the question. Yeah, I didn't understand your question. Now, the crystal structure, we assume, for example, that it's an equilibrium state. Okay. Now, and if you do your calculations and get the free energy surface with your force field, you may then see the crystal structure may not be exactly sitting here. It may be here. It might be. This may be due to the fact that the crystal structure is just stable under those conditions or because it has those, you know, artifacts. But uh, the way I would like to think is the native, there is a native macro state, if you like. Okay. And then uh, within this native state, which is here, you have some substates. So what the elastic network model allows you to do is to move from one uh, substate to another. And all of those substates are functional. And they are separated by low energy barriers. This is, again, another important concept. You don't want your protein to be too stable, right? Why? <laughs> if the protein is too stable, it's not going to move. It will be very happy. You want your protein to be slightly unhappy, slightly frustrated. And frustrated is a scientific term. I'm energetically frustrated. Because if the protein is frustrated, if it's ready somehow to uh, it should be able to go or you know, move here or move there to access the other substates. If it's, for example, when you design in uh, synthetic biology, when you design a protein, you don't want it to be really too stable because it's not going to move then. What matters is the functionality. So you need a marginal stability. You may have seen this term marginal stability in textbook. It has functional meaning. You want the protein to be flexible, actually. Because flexibility means adaptability. And adaptability is the number one requirement for functionality, too. <laughs> OK, now let's go back to the, to the reality. <laughs> what is happening? Oh, I mentioned to you the combination of MD and ANM. This was a work of a very talented postdoctoral fellow, uh, CoMD. We are, I don't know what, we, what is the current stage. We have been implementing CoMD in Prodi, and it will soon be available. But uh, just uh, make sure you can just follow and see when this will be officially made accessible. But this combines, actually, what it does is you do MD simulations. You're not tired, are you? You're not bored either. OK. Because I'm not going to stop, <laughs> uh, because I have a lot to say. So what you do is you do MD simulations, but your MD simulations now you want to have your uh, protein really move a little bit better in the conformational space to surmount those energy barriers to access the substates. So you want uh, to give those intrinsically favorable modes of motions like a targeted MD for those of you who are familiar. So the targeted directions will be those that we predict by the elastic network model. So you are steering, if you like, your, there's a steered MD. 
for so we this is uh, as I mentioned uh, the first paper was in 2008 and we have been improving we've uh, published with many different groups to me that's the fa uh, my favorite right now uh, and so it's the one way of accelerating your MD to be able to sample a broader space and by doing so you know you can generate uh, you can have a much better co coverage of the energy landscape. So this is the same picture. This is the supposedly native state, but it can easily come here. These are all uh, equilibrium simulations. Yeah. Similar to what? Uh, Metadynamics. Metadynamics. Could be, kind of. But the whole thing is that here, uh, the, uh, the way you bias your uh, trajectory is along those naturally accessible modes. Because these are called natural. These are defined by the architecture. So you don't need to do any simulation for deciding where to go. You have, uh, you, from your analysis of the structure, you know now what are the most, that, what are the softest events, easiest events. And you want to give your protein a kick, you know, just facilitate those movements. <laughs> Okay. A major application is to allosteric, and I'm gonna. Okay, we're gonna have fun now. Uh, uh, what I try to do is uh, this is like a, a hands-on application. By the way, uh, did you try to upload ProD? Were you able to? If not. We, uh, uh, Chakra and others will help you in the lunch break. Just give them your laptop, okay? If you have any trouble, because we will just uh, start to the hands-on part in uh, right after lunch. But this is a short uh, demo that I would like to do, and let's see <coughs> how it's going to go. Unfortunately, here my screen is very small you will have the advantage of having a bigger screen. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go out of this. So here I, I wrote, a, a, suppose now you have a given protein, okay? And the protein I'm gonna choose is uh, this one. Uh, from the PDB, you have uh, one COT. This is a cytochrome C, OK? And suppose I'm, I, I'm, I'm interested in understanding the dynamics of this protein, the collective dynamics. So here are the, uh, what you do. Uh, and I, I'm going to go with you all on all steps. So first, I need to go to, I need a Python window. OK. And of course, if it doesn't work, it means that there is a problem with my laptop <laughs> or with me. So the first thing you do is you, you open such a, uh, a new window to work with. And then you type, uh, and you have this uh, uh, slide in your notes. So you type from Prodi import. You import now Prodi. OK, that's the first thing. And I'm just copy pasting from here, so you can easily repeat everything that I'm doing here. So you import also PyLab, which is the software tools in Python. And you know, to generate the uh, ANM results, of course, uh, it's good if you, you know the Python comments, but uh, even if you don't know, if you write this, this is just the command to, do cal to calculate the ANM modes for the protein 1COT. This is the PDB code you need to have. And you uh, just select the alpha carbons. It already did it. That's it. The analysis is done. And I call it ANM. I give it this name. Those of you who have your laptop, you can repeat with me if you like. So what we did, uh, what it did, it also gives you a little bit of information. So this protein has 1,000 atoms. It built the hessian in point 0.19 seconds. Can't be faster than that, right? 
And then, uh, because we are uh, more interested in the global motions, it just evaluated the slowest 20 modes, which is a good, a very decent subset. 20 modes were calculated in 0.03 seconds. Okay. This is a look at the contrast with MD. <laughs> and then I have my ANM. So it, I, I just checked. This is a protein, uh, and I have I know now that it's 20 uh, modes. It's composed of 121 nodes, which means 121 amino acids, right? And I gave it the name COT already in the previous. So we selected. Uh, this is the alpha carbon selected version. Now suppose I want now to see the protein in my very very simple representation, but we have uh, a Link to VMD, you will see. But suppose now I want to see it. <clears throat> and the command for seeing it in three dimension is show protein. Let's see if it's going to work. Yes, magic. That's the protein in three dimensions, OK? And you can see from different perspectives like that. So this is the right protein you are working on. Now suppose now you want to see the square fluctuations, mean square fluctuations, right? And now we plot the mean square fluctuations here. Okay. Here magic. Here are the mean square fluctuations. But these are <coughs> Yeah, I think uh, these are based on 10 modes. It tells you how many modes, actually. So you can select, uh, you can take all modes or a few modes. Now you know that these regions, these residues in this protein are really highly flexible, for example. They move a lot. OK? What else? I think uh, we already did that. Is it any different? Why is it repeating? OK, you want to put the label. But the label was already there. <laughs> OK, so this is the same thing. So, so far, uh, you, you know, you have the structure. You have the uh, mean square fluctuations. So next, next, we will, let's suppose we want to view the color-coded animations, how it moves in this mode, right? And now we're going to connect to uh, NAMD, uh, VMD. So again, I copy-paste from here. Just for, OK. Now I have generated a file for visualization of the movement of the motion. And I need to start VMD. VMD. Where is VMD? Where is VMD on my machine? OK, good. Now, VMD comes with multiple windows, you know. <laughs> Lots of windows. Now, uh, we select extensions, analysis, normal mode wizard. Everything is written here. I am, so I'm going to select extension. Let's see again. Extension, analysis, normal mode wizard. Analysis. OK, normal mode wizard. Easy. OK. And after that, obviously, you load the NMD file. Normally, you need to know where it is located. In my case, I just uh, I knew that it's located here. I located it here. So you can check from uh, print working directory if you need. So this is the file that I just generated. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> so you can repeat everything. So here is, uh, I'm supposed to see the animation now. Here's the animation, here's the file. 
Does it look like an animation? No. <laughs> but it will. <laughs> so this is the protein. And what I, I'm seeing here is the mode one. You see the mode one. OK? If I want to animate uh, the animation, I, I need to let it play. It's moving. <laughs> this is magic. So you have, uh, you can see from different perspectives. So your, or, unfortunately, the quality is not. Uh, I hope you are able to see that we have a, can you dim the light further? Or is it easy or difficult? Okay, maybe uh, yeah. That's. Oh. It's slightly better. Okay, it's slightly better. So what this uh, movie is showing is the original structure and its alternative conformations, how it moves in mode one. Okay, and uh, <coughs> I don't know whomever uh, defined those uh, arrows as yellow here. This is yellow tree. You can, let's say, let's have white, maybe that's, you know, you have the white arrows. Yes, Darius. Uh, I see there, there are parts of this structure that there is no structure, secondary structure available. Can, can you consider this in your calculation? Or maybe you have the white is a dinosaur? Uh, so there is no secondary structure available, means what? The several region in this protein, this, this one that you already uh -huh. Yeah, we, uh, the PDB, if the PDB has a secondary structure information in the PDB file, it is possible to add that one to your movies. You know, you just uh, copy paste in your files the secondary structure information. I guess in this case, this was not incorporated, simply that information. Okay. No, no. In usually what happens is that uh, those regions, the helices for example, are very tightly packed, right? So internally the helix won't be distorted. What will happen is the helix as a whole moving. Or same thing for beta strands. I didn't show that, but <coughs> there are very uh, clear pictures for, let's say, a beta barrel. All the minima are at the strands and all the maxima are at the loops. Usually the loops move more. And uh, strands, they move rigidly, usually. Okay? You maintain this hydrogen bond pattern, actually, because it is already uh, built in the connectivity matrix. When you have more contacts, it's not going to easily deform it. Okay? And secondary structures, like helices, are packed, high, tightly packed regions, so they will be maintained. They can unwind from one end, but usually the helix will be maintained. So you can see here, uh, you know, you can, we can exaggerate the motion, if you like. Uh, or you can uh, select the mode that you would like to see. Let's go to mode three. So this is mode three. It, it is slightly different. You may not see, but I, I will just. So this is the mode three. Now what happens is that, uh, oh, this is exaggerating the, the motion here. In some cases, some, there may be some, you know, exaggerated movements. And you need to, there are methods to prevent that. But this is just the first quick estimate. So if we go back to mode one, uh, the, when you know that, uh, let's say, two regions <coughs> move with respect to each other, this is how you generate your alternative confirmations for docking. You know, each of those snapshots give you, uh, yeah. How come some? parts move past their vector and other, maybe for small vectors, sort of just go back to the big loop. I'm sorry? It, it, How come like what? On the big loop by your arrow. The this one? Yeah, that's moving past its And the vector. arrows are big, yeah. Uh, but it's moving past the other direction of the, I guess, state that you started from versus. Yeah, because these are fluctuations. They move like that with respect to the starting. Usually, you would see, uh, now forget the original stuff. Let's say the original structure is this. During the fluctuations, you go in both directions. Okay? But then uh, you know that there is this uh, mobility uh, you know, for a region to cl close down, which may bind a substrate. You can see these things. Okay? 
and you can make him you know you can use those alternative confirmations Uh, they never hit each other. Oh, I've never seen that for the last 18 years. But maybe you will see that. I don't know. <laughs> I think if you uh, have very unrealistic uh, you know, deformations, if you move them a lot, anything can happen. You can have abnormal uh, you know, covalent bonds the, you know, being stretched too much, etc. But I think uh, you have to realize that these motions are uh, near an equilibrium state. So uh, the default parameters here would give you reasonable sizes. And they are scaled with respect to each other. Again, this is mode one. Mode two movements will be smaller in principle. Mode three will be smaller, etc., because they are being scaled. Weight, each of them has a weight defined by the eigenvalue. All right, uh, so I will uh, continue a little bit and then let Tim take, uh, because I want to finish at 10.30. So let's continue. Are you having fun? OK. <laughs> this is the purpose, to have fun, right? We, we're here to have fun. Now cross correlations, cross correlations. We're going to have cross correlations. Uh, remember, cross correlations are uh, how different things move with respect to each other. Now, already you know from your uh, movies what, things that are cross correlated, but we're going to generate a cross correlation map, okay? All right, let's do that. So, what is cross correlation? And this will be based on, uh, you know, you will not learn all the details. But again, this is the simple, the simple uh, command for that. And we want to plot a, uh, this is the just, you, now we have already generated the cross correlation map. What is the cross correlation map? The one that I've shown for hemoglobin, actually, but I didn't discuss it. Uh, so we want to show it. show. Here is magic, cross correlation. <laughs> so what does this mean? <laughs> what do you see here? These are all residues from 1 to 120, 1 to 120. And this is the scale, right? Uh, so the, the, uh, whenever something is red, it is 1. It means it is correlated, highly correlated, right? So these, uh, this uh, substructure from residue 8 to 20, let's say, they are highly correlated. They move as a rigid block. And this is another rigid block, probably, another one, etc. almost. And then, uh, let's say, uh, this portion of the chain and that portion show a region blue. They are anti-correlated. They move in opposite directions. So this map tells you a lot. And the, the crossovers between the red and blue would be also local, uh, you know, flexing regions, local hinges, uh, if you like. So there are uh, those, the, this is a flexing region, etc. You can see from, so this map already tells you, for example, what happens, uh, you may have the correlations between nearby residues, but you can have correlations between even distant residues, right? And uh, this is how, for example, signals propagate. You may have something binding here, but because it is correlated with the distant residues, it may have an effect over there, allosteric effect. Yeah? I don't know what those discontinuities are. We, we need to go back to the structure and see. Maybe there are uh, missing residues, or I don't know. So this is a good example of box that you need to look at. <laughs> Uh, so, of course, when you have your system, your case study, you just uh, analyze the results. You Maybe in the original structure, one COT. I don't know why this thing is, you are talking about this, right? So there, there may be, I don't know, the, uh, there may be a very sharp change there, something sticking out or some discontinuity in the original structure. I don't know. 
All right, I, I think I want to stop here because I have one more, uh, I had more demo here. You could uh, generate, you could generate uh, these things also in VMD. And that was my next slide, but you can do it in your, the hands-on session. <coughs> I think I want, I need to stop here. But uh, because of the time constraints, and because I started to cough. <laughs> uh, let me just get rid of everything. I, I just want to close everything. And I'll leave it here for the uh, hands-on session. Now, we, uh, if we go back to the uh, lecture, to my lecture notes, I let me uh, just briefly mention the rest, so that you won't be sorry about missing the remaining part of the lecture. <laughs> ubiquitin. Do you know what ubiquitin is? Ubiquitin is very ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. Why? Because it binds many, many different proteins. <coughs> it binds them to bring them. It's the kiss of death, you know? It just takes them to the proteasomal machinery. And ubiquitin needs to really adapt. Uh, it, it will be binding many proteins with different shapes. It is a protein, a typical promiscuous protein with multiple uh, partners, multiple uh, substrates. And in the PDB, there are many, many structures for the ubiquitin. There are 140 structures, and these models are NMR models. So if you superimpose them, you can already tell what is the type of, for example, it has a tail that is really very flexible, which apparently facilitates binding. But then there is some flexibility in other regions too. So we, we try to uh, analyze those ensembles, known structures, and the ProD will let you do that also. You know, you don't need to, in this case, I generated the dynamics using a &M, right? But <coughs> suppose you don't trust uh, what com a computer program or what a simple model, like elastic network model, predicts. And now you want to make the most of existing experimental data. You can take all those structures and just analyze them, do principal component analysis, and try to see what are the dominant changes in structure. These are also modes of conformational change, right? And this becomes particularly important in a few applications. One of them is drug targets. I have already mentioned the PP38 map kinase, and you can see that in the presence of different drugs, it'll, it's, it's gonna uh, change slightly its structure. It's a, another example of a target that is, uh, we call that multi-specificity. Multi-specificity is a very weird uh, word because specific things should be specific to something, right? How can you have multi-specificity? But that is a well-established term in biology for proteins like uh, MAP kinase, that's P38, that can specifically bind many different inhibitors and like ubiquitin also, that may bind multiple substrates, just uh, by virtue of their conformational flexibility, okay? Or molecular machines like that. Actually, for this Groyan machine, we have a series of uh, conformations that resolved. This is most another students actually who got a PhD in physics in my lab, a very talented individual. Okay, so the uh, I think we saw that. Okay, this is a, something I, I promised you to mention. Now, suppose, uh, and I will conclude with that probably, just showing a biological application. I said, okay, we can see, for example, how this interface moves along the mode, okay? What is interesting, what is beautiful is the following. If we focus on the interface, these blue residues are uh, the negatively charged and red ones are positively charged. 
what is happening is there is a redistribution of salt bridges. So the originally, uh, during this motion, so for example, this was forming a salt bridge. It's changing partner then, and then it is approaching this one. You see what is happening? The red and blue pairs are changing. This is called a redistribution of salt bridge. And this is some kind of an allosteric switch, actually. Now, what uh, now we know that this movement is critical, this allosteric switch, this uh, redistribution of salt bridges. Salt bridge is something happening between a negative and positively charged amino acid, you know? The interaction between two oppositely charged amino acids. Now, the, uh, this salt bridge is critical for functionality. And guess what? Helen uh, Seibel at Oxford, uh, she uh, actually did uh, those experiments where she mutated one of those residues here. And where is it? The, the uh, glutamate 461. Glutamate 461 over here. So one, that one that changes partner. Now when you mutate and you put instead a lysine, what did you do? You moved from a negatively charged amino acid to a positively charged amino acid. That's it, something really drastic. And the salt bridge that was previously formed can't be formed. And now the, uh, whatever was happening in the wild type here, in the mutant, you can see that it's not anymore there. It's changed its partner or it got released. So there is a redistribution of salt bridge, exactly like described here, actually. So what the mutation is doing, and that's really important, what the mutation is doing is uh, stabilizing a new conformation that is actually pre-existing as an alternative conformation. So the molecule is already ready to do that, right? The molecule is ready to do this movement, and it needs to go back and forth. Now, in this uh, mutation, this alternative conformation that's already accessible is being stabilized. And then, uh, of course, the entire allosteric cycle is being arrested because you have, uh, you have interfered with this important switch mechanism. And that's what experimentally uh, was observed. So the lesson, there are many, many lessons from here. But to me, the most important lesson is mutations, when they alter the structure or the dynamics, they alter the structure in the directions that the structure is already predisposed to do. So the, if you want to understand the effect of a mutation, you still need to understand also the effect, uh, the intrinsic capabilities. You know what? What you are, if you are, what you are interfering with, if it's in, at a hinge region, or you are interfering with some salt bridge distribution, that's really critical. And you can predict what the mutation does. Okay. So this was a simple application, and the rest I will let you, I will finish with this one. This is one of my favorite papers. Uh, Dan from Weizmann Institute is one of, the, I think, the deepest, deep, deepest thinkers of our time, one of them. And uh, this is from a science paper of his. He's just, uh, this is an important uh, concept that I try to uh, convey on and on. Conformational flexibility is extremely important for substrate selectivity. Okay? And the intrinsically accessible motions enable the optimal binding of substrate. So this is the same protein. By the way, it's a SIP uh, cytochrome uh, P40, uh, P450. And uh, these are two alternative conformations of the same molecule, the blue and the orange. The orange is bound to the red uh, ligand drug, and the blue is bound to the blue ligand. So it accommodates two different substrate binding depending on its extent of opening. So that is this type of adaptability is extremely important for uh, uh, functionality. So I will stop here with this beautiful slide. <laughs> and I will let you take a break. And then I think Tim will take over, right? Thank you very much.